Hello, I'm Brent Halpern, and I am the Scientific Director of the AI Horizons Network, and this is our weekly seminar uh, for AI Horizons. Uh, this week we have Abhijit Mishra from Avim Research in India, who will pre be presenting a version of his AAAI paper on supervised controllable text formalizations. Um, Abhijit is in the Bangalore India lab. Uh, working for AI Tech. Prior to that, he was a PhD scholar at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Bombay. So without further ado, Abhijit. Thanks, Brent. Uh, and um, hello, everyone. This is Abhijit. And uh, as said in the introduction, I'm going to be presenting unsupervised controllable text formalization. So uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. Uh, Parag, Jain, Amar, Ajad, and Karthik, uh, who are also part of uh, IBM Research India. And uh, you can check out for more information in my uh, URL, that's abhijitmishra.github.io, and you can download data sets, code, and other resources related to this work uh, from the given link. Right, so let's begin then. So most of us are I think familiar with this uh, famous robot, uh, CARS from the movie Interstellar. Uh, for the uninitiated, it's uh, it's a robot which which it sort of behaves like humans and is configurable uh, to some extent, and uh, it assists humans for their space space. Uh, in fact, the extraordinary Interstellar mission, uh, and this is de depicted in the movie. Uh, one thing that distinguishes this robot from this from from the traditional uh, chatbots or robots is that uh, uh, it, it is configurable. Uh, like uh, as you see in this example, we can control the way the, the 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 way we want this robot to behave. For example, if the humor is 75 percent, then uh, the uh, the robot not only in in its uh, words but also in its action uh, tries to be uh, humorous. Uh, whereas if you reduce it, then obviously uh, the humor quotient uh, reduces and the content of humor in the conversation also reduces. So configura configurable mind is actually a, something that is a key goal of strong AI, which is artificial general intelligence, the objective of which is to produce systems that behave in the similar manner as human beings. So in a way, if we produce systems that are controllable by users in the, at runtime and uh, they're able to respond to our uh, queries or inputs in a controllable manner, we are getting a step closer to uh, the, the, the principles of artificial general in intelligence or strong AI. So this is a scientific motivation behind our work, uh, which falls under the umbrella of uh, natural language generation. Uh, NLG or natural language generation is a branch of computational linguistics that deals with generation of natural language text from unstructured or structured data in textual or non-textual forms. So to say, uh, if we have to categorize it, would uh, be there will be two categories. One is text to text, text to text NLG, under which there will be uh, tasks like machine translation, summarization, document paraphrasing, text simplification, and text style transfer as opposed to data to text, which uh, deals with, uh, you know, summary generation from data, uh, which will have uh, obviously uh, implications in, in real world scenarios, like you want to summarize, uh, let's say, patent information in, in clinical context where the lab reports are in tabular form and you want to generate summaries, et cetera. So, and, and of course it also encompasses other forms of uh, generation problems like persuasive text generation and story generation from events, where events are uh, a sequence of data given in tuple format or any other format. So this is a this is an overview of natural language generation. One of which one one of the subtasks in natural language generation is text style transfer, which is the uh, sort of the key uh, objective, uh, sort of the key task that we are focusing in this particular work. However, as, an, uh, as, a, uh, as a team uh, that targets NLG problems, we do have, uh, we have made our hands that dirty with uh, both text-to-text -text and data-to-text uh, uh, problems in IBM research. 
Right. So text style transfer, what is it? It is transferring uh, textual content from one, one stylistic form to another form without disturbing semantics. Uh, so you, to some extent, you want to preserve the semantics uh, that is given in the input. Do not have to have a lot of topical drift or semantic drift from the input. Uh, if we have to view uh, uh, style transfer in a in a three-dimensional manner, we have one in one axis. Uh, we have the linguistic artifacts that's lexical semantic syntactic pragmatic so for example you could transfer style at lexical level or semantic or syntactic level or uh, uh, you could have transferring of styles at a per perceptual perceptual level which will deal with tone formalness sentiment emotion and complexity as well as you're also going to uh, be able to vary styles by varying the domain for example the Tone in finance domain could be different from healthcare. So uh, the domain also forms another axis in this view. Uh, to give some examples of, let's consider uh, this uh, sentence, the movie is terrible. You could transform it into this sentence. This is messy, uncouth, incomprehensible, vicious, and absurd, which dealt with lexical level transformation. And it, uh, in a perceptual level, it uh, dealt with sentiment intensity variation. It made the sentence more formal and made the uh, the, the, the sentence ha has a higher level of complexity. This is as opposed to uh, this another form of transformation for the same sentence, uh, a somewhat crudely constructed and hence quite an unwatchable movie it was. So it deals with syntactic transformations uh, as well as semantic in some sense. And it is to some extent formal, but not very formal, as opposed to another uh, transformation, which is you sit through these kinds of movies because the theater has air conditioning. This deals with uh, pragmatic artifacts. For example, uh, air conditioning being good is not a criteria for a movie being good. So this deals with world knowledge and not present in the input text. Uh, and it also varies sentiment intensity, but to some extent it is informal. So as we can see, style transfer can happen at various levels uh, and it can touch upon various aspects of text generation. Uh, right. So controllable text transformation, the system view is like this. So you have an input text uh, and you would like to transform it into another version and you should have uh, po power over controlling the system. For example, you could have control specifications in terms of wording, sentiment, word count, formalness, politeness, etc. You should be able to provide these things as input at runtime. And based on the inputs along with the text, the system should be able to produce a transformed version of the text. Right, so this is the overall view. Uh, to build such systems, uh, traditionally what has happened is that in text generation, people have used a large amount of parallel data or paired data where the input output data points are available, you take them and you train um, machine transition systems or sequence to sequence systems or gener generation systems in general, which relies, uh, rely on these kinds of supervision. However, in controllable text transformation, it's quite hard to you know, uh, build, build data sets, uh, which will sort of encompass all sorts of possible scenarios. For example, if you had to pick sentiment and then Syntactic level, syntactic level transformations for healthcare domain, you would have to build a separate data set as opposed to if you had to deal with some other form of combination. The uh, large number of combinations possible and for each combination, for each use cases, building supervised data sets or labeled data sets for supervised learning is not uh, a desirable thing. Uh, and also when you are trying to make the system controllable, then you're also dealing with uh, the, the scenario where you have to sort of get control parameters as input in runtime. So any label data for that would also require the control information to be available, which makes the data set creation part even more difficult, uh, as well as if you had to create it by force, then it would be very sparse because you really need to have all sorts of possible variations of output for all sorts of possible control values. So it's very unsustainable. So this has motivated us to work on unsupervised uh, controllable text uh, style transfer. And the key use case that uh, we tackled here is unsupervised text formalization. 
in style transfer uh, very recently because of this uh, uh, huge uh, explosion of deep learning and uh, you know deep learning and reinforcement learning a lot of systems have been proposed uh, key systems include unsupervised machine translation systems style transfer using non parallel text uh, that's a classic uh, that was a classic uh, nairips paper uh, uh, published a couple of years ago then we have this sequence to better sequence idea where you are really transforming a sequence uh, into another sequence by virtue of some external signals which come from nlp systems this is one of the closest systems that we have as baselines uh, baseline in our experiment then uh, there is a work on controllable text generation and paraphrase generation but all of them are quite recent and they are to some extent based on neural paradigms uh, text formalization uh, uh, formal english is often used in a serious context that's the definition and for example we see of see them often in official documents books news reports etc uh, as opposed to informal english which is used in everyday conversation uh formal text often is carefully edited and often is longer and is more complicated so to some extent if i have to summarize the readability grade or the grade educational grade required to understand formal text is typically higher this is a key observation that we utilize in our system so that i just uh, wanted to remind uh, the listeners uh existing works in formal text generation uh comprise text generation using heuristic based approaches and nlp systems uh, these are the older systems uh, relatively older systems uh, very lately uh, polite conversation generation engines have been proposed using sequence to sequence variants and uh, formal to informal formal and informal text classifier systems are also proposed uh, right so controllable text formalization why is it important as i said controllable text generation is a a uh, key uh, uh, problem which has both scientific as well as uh, industrial or practical merit uh, and it's uh, especially controllable text formalization is very relevant in nlg applications for example formal conversation generation automatic email response composition summary generation in regulatory compliance domains which are difficult domains by the way and uh, we can also use this module of controllable text formalization in computer assisted generation systems which is similar to computer assisted translation systems which is a huge business in especially in europe where uh, translations are often produced with help uh, with the help of uh, such systems so apart from automated systems human assisted systems are, are likely to leverage such uh, modules so it it forms a real uh, real world uh, it's it's really a real real world problem it's not just a fascinating idea uh so existing literature what are they missing typically what I, what we have seen is that the literature uh, the works uh, uh, do not have the ability to accept control parameters most of them and they do not they are not extremely aware of uh, different artifacts that are related to controllable text formalization for example fluency they uh, one has to ensure that the fluency of the output text is maintained as well as it uh, is related semantically with the input and it is more formal so these kinds of systems existing systems are not trained with such uh, objectives right so our triple ai paper was on controllable natural language transformation and we focused on uh, uh, text formalization the degree of formalization control is given as input during run time so the system would pretty much look like this so if you had a phrase very big building and if you have to transform it into formal more formal versions you could control the way you would want to transform the input phrase uh some key features of our uh, approach or work is the uh, are, are here so our work is uh, our work employs an unsupervised training scheme and uh, but thereby it handles uh, the infeasibility to annotate data for each input output control uh, instances it really preserves the language semantics that's one of the key goals and for learning uh, in a in an unsupervised setting it takes the help of of the self nlp modules which just uh, do the job of scoring and the validation of the output 
uh, the control uh, degree, uh, uh, yeah. So it also facilitates to control the degree of the intended attribute desired at the output. And uh, we can show that with with little bit of tweaks, it can it can uh, be uh, upgraded to include multiple control inputs as well. So here is the central idea. What happens is that we are we begin training of our system by using system uh, sentences from unlabeled corpora. And let's say we have an initial model which is going to randomly produce a version of uh, transformed version of the input text. Uh, we have the first phase which is called exploration, which is responsible for generating more and more amount of training data along with the control value. Uh, as a result of which we have few sample paraphrases of the inputs from the unlabeled corpora. Along with that, we have uh, the control values. Once we sample such instances, we use these instances as training data to retrain our initial model, which is called exploitation. And at the end of exploitation, the model is uh, sort of, uh, it has got the knowledge to some extent about how to formalize text in, in a controllable manner. And if we keep doing this in an iterative manner, at the end of the day, we converge and have a model which is uh, good at uh, producing controlled variations of the input text. Uh, once we have the model trained, uh, during testing, we just uh, give the input sentence and the control value, and we obtain uh, the transformed sentence as output. So I'll delve, uh, delve deeper into the model now. So the model is not uh very uh, an unus unusual model it's based on the classic encode attend decode paradigm uh typically used in neural machine translation just that we we modified one portion of the uh system that is the decoder and we added one uh, extra input to the decoder that is the control parameter obviously we want the control parameter to come as an input from the user so the decoder is empowered to take the control parameter as well, which is uh, not a very uh, non-trivial step, by the way. So we can just, uh, with a little bit of tweak, add as many number of more inputs to the decoders as possible. The encoder and decoder modules are comprised of embedding layers uh, and stack layers of recurrent units. Uh, this is also a standard setup as we often see in um, sequence to sequence or neural machine translation systems. Uh, the training phase begins with uh, the pre-training step where uh, given sentences from unlabeled corpora, the, the, the encode attend decode, decoder module is actually trained to perform auto-encoding that it takes the sentences and learns to reconstruct the same sentence. This is done to have a better initialization as opposed to a random initialization of the model. Uh, and uh, by the way, our decoder always expects an input that is uh, that corresponds to the control parameter. So here, uh, during pre-training, we keep the control parameter as the default parameter. And uh, uh, we have some iterative, so the, the system undergoes pre-training for a certain number of iterations, and we see that the losses are minimized, so we stop the pre-training uh, at that moment. The second phase of training is exploration, where the system doesn't undergo any training. Instead, what we do is from the sample, from the sentences sampled from the unlabeled corpus, we feed it to the encoder decoder framework, and we we do not take the decoder output as such because it's going to be the same, almost uh, a, a similar version uh, as the input. Uh, what we do instead is we sample different variations uh, of output from the decoder. Uh, that's done by typically sampling the distribution that decoder produces. Apart from that, what we do is we have another sampler module which takes this sampling sampled sentences and produces a paraphrase of the sampled uh, sentence uh, produce, produced. And then what we do is once we sampled enough number of sentences, we score them for different uh, uh, language aspects. For example, the readability, the fluency, and relatedness measures are scored uh, for each sampled sentences. Uh, and then, based on that, we select a sentence which has the maximum 
which maximizes such, uh, the, all of these three scores. Right? So we have we have a scheme to do that. So the sampler essentially what I ex uh, described just before just just now that it sampled it samples k sentences uh, with an objective to maximize the cumulative language score. The language scores, let's say, it, it is given by g x y, and the sampler is given uh, sampler is a function called sample k y g. Y g is the output of the decoder, uh, and we produce let's say k samples from sample k. Uh, we have to select a sentence which maximizes the score. Uh, right. And just to remind you, in our architecture, we use a very simplistic sampler which takes the sentence and produce only lexical variants of the sentence. However, as the state of the art progresses, one can definitely use more uh, complex form of sampling strategies. For example, there has been some work on give sampling based sampling, text sampling, and then there are obviously variational autoencoder based paraphrasers which can be used for sampling as well. Uh, once we sample sentences, we need to be sure that the sentences that we are selecting are actually uh, beneficial for our training purpose. So sentences which uh, maximize the like maximize the GXY score are picked for this purpose. The GXY is given as a weighted sum of three different measures such as R, S, R, F and R, D. R, S is the semantic similarity between the input and the output. RF is the fluency or grammaticality of the output and RD is the readability grade of the output. So the readability grade, fluency and semantic similarity measures are actually uh, computed using off the self tools. For example, one can use skip thought based uh, models to uh, compute semantic similarities or ordinate based similarities or any other traditional na natural language processing based similarity measures can be used to detect semantic similarity. For fluency, Typically, we use language models. One can use n-gram language models or the latest neural language models for this purpose. For readability, there are many measures. Uh, most of them are heavily lexicalized. However, they are pretty good in uh, measuring the readability grades. One such popular measure is the flesh kinkade readability grade, uh, and this is considered in our setup. Uh, once we have the scores ready, we do a, a weighted sum. The beta parameters are uh, sort of decided while development by trial and error and the we will we will uh, disclose more details regarding the betas in the experiment setup section so why do we consider readability for text formalization formal texts tend to require more language expertise to un understand them higher is the formalness more is the readability grade requirement that's the uh, observation from for for the data set for, for our data sets for example <clears throat> For example, if you consider a formal sentence as the price of five dollars was reasonable, I decided to make the purchase without further thought has a very high readability grade as per three different uh, readability measurement uh, metrics as opposed to the informal text. I was like five. It, it was like five bucks. So I was like, OK, let's buy it. So in a way, readability is related to text formalness. So in, if and we do have such uh, measurement systems. So we we thought of leveraging it, right? So once we have sampled our sentences uh, and uh, you know selected the best sentence possible by virtue of the uh, three different metrics, we just determine the control values for the sentences. For example, uh, if I uh, have a sentence which has a higher readability grade, to what extent the readability grade is higher than the input sentence that decides the control values. So uh, here is a, an equation which uh, gives a bucketing of control values based on the uh, output. For example, the control value could be one if uh, the ratio of the readability of the sample sentence is uh, less than some threshold value, uh, uh, which is decided by trial and error. If it is between two threshold values, then it, the control value becomes two and likewise. So we do have at the end of the day, uh, a data set which uh, is generated by exploration phase, which has this X, which is input sentence, Y, which is the sampled output and C, that is the control value. So with this data set, what we do is we now train our model, right? So one can think of, okay, we have a model which has an encoder and decoder and a control 
enable decoder, decoder so we can straight away uh, train it using traditional reconstruction loss or cross entropy loss however what we realize that cross entropy loss is not alone sufficient to ensure that the control values especially the c is taken care of by the model at, and it has a role to play in the learning process so we uh, augment this traditional encoder decoder framework with another another classifier which is trained in order to with, with an objective to predict if i give you two sentences one is the original input and one is a sampled output can you predict whether and we have the input control as well can you predict whether it uh, the, the produced sampled output actually conforms to the input control or not so this system is trained separately before starting the exploitation phase and once this system is trained it is just used as it is while training our encoder decoder framework uh, the encoder decoder framework has two losses now one is the reconstruction loss which is how good are you in generating target sentences which are linked to, which are sort of related to the input and they are also related to the sampled sentences along with that we are also checking whether the generated output uh, has similar control values computed as given in the input what is the relation between the input control value and the control values computed from the uh, output sentences if there is a disparity then it incurs more loss that's why it has it is bound the network is bound to learn to adhere to the input control specifications as well uh, so why control predictor i just explained it we need it because cross entropy loss is not alone uh, adequate, adequate enough to tackle the, the to to decide whether the control values given by the user as input is taken care of uh, uh, while the learning process goes on right so with this uh, idea we experiment uh, our uh, experiment our system like with with a data set which has uh, around 14500 unlabeled simple sentences this is quite less however we do have promising results with such small amount of data set some small small amount of data uh, the sources are from enron email corpus uh, the data, the sentences are taken from enrol in enron email corpus the corpus of late modern english prose uh, non spam email from spam data set and ss for kids we have split the data set into 80 12 and 8 percent trained valid and test uh, splits and the vocab size is close to 100000 uh, the average normalized flesh kinked readability for the data set is 0.54 this is the normalized score which ranges from 0 to 1 and obviously the data set is available in this link uh, we have uh, in our core model we have a bidirectional groove based encoder with two layers and two layers of unidirectional uh, groove for decoder the embedding dimension is set to 300 encoder hidden dimension is 250 and decoder is 500 this is all very emp empirically decided the pa various parameters are also decided based on trial and error uh, to just to remind you that uh, the the we have because of this par uh, because of the scope of uh deciding these parameters while developing the system can be easily adapted to different objectives for example if you had to use this system for healthcare domain as opposed to compliance domain the beta values can can be changed accordingly uh, similarly for control parameters also we have uh, arrived at these values of 1.05 and 1.1 and we conduct 20 cycles of exploration exploitation with sampling size of k equal to 100 uh, for testing we ha do have three control values as i, I uh, showed in the equation oh, the value one corresponds to retaining uh, the input as it is uh, control value two corresponds to mild for introduction of mild formalness into the uh, sentence and control value 3 makes the system highly uh, makes the sentence highly formal uh, for evaluation we have uh, three baselines the first baseline is the sequence to sequence uh, sequence to better sequence system by Mueller uh, in this the approach is that we have a traditional auto encoding setup but during auto encoding the system also learns to 
take into account some scores produced by external systems. Uh, for our setup, we have FK readability scores uh, considered for this. Uh, the baseline two is a non-iterative version of, of our own system where we don't go, uh, we don't do exploration exploitation in an iterative manner. The system just goes one round of multi-iterative sampling, like many times you sample and gather your training data and just do a one shot training based on the data. Uh, uh, this is done because this would be a much cheaper and faster system, right? Because it doesn't have to go through an iterative process of training and exploration. Uh, baseline three is where we don't have the control predictor. We just use the cross entropy loss. Uh, the, our main task is to generate output for the text, please, text split for uh, different control values. However, we also consider an auxiliary task of uh, reverse simplification which is a flipped version of text simplification. And for this, we consider the data, a popular text simplification data set. So the idea is that the system has to learn to make simpler sentences more complicated, not necessarily more formal, but at least this is the closest uh, task for which there exists a data set. So we considered this task. Uh, right, so for the main task, the results are uh, here. So the key observations is, uh, key observations are that we have, we obtain better readability grade when we use the whole system as opposed to when we don't use a control predictor and when we train the system in a one shot manner. Uh, the system, uh, proposed system does uh, way better than Wheeler's systems. system. Uh, models which are not uh, iteratively trained or which do not have control predictor, they typically end up uh, converging to autoencoding, and they are typically agnostic of control levels. Uh, so that's a key takeaway. Uh, because of this iterative scheme of learning, the system really is able to produce and learn uh, how to corroborate with the control uh, values provided by the user at runtime. Uh, right, and baseline one, which is Mueller's system, this is not doing very well, we suspect that uh, it requires much more data for training, uh, which we don't have. And uh, because it has to learn a sentence distribu distribution, inherent sen sentence distribution, which it tweaks by the help of the, uh, the scorers. And this is not possible with small amount of data. Perhaps it's because of that it has not done very well. Uh, the graph at the right hand side showed the agreement between uh, desired input control and control measure on the output text, we see that uh, the the for for the control uh, formalness of high degree high, there there is a considerable amount of agreement in all the three variants of our system. Uh, the complete ensemble system agrees a lot uh, with seventy around seventy percent of accuracy. However, for uh, the mid range, actually it's very confusing. Sometimes the system produces a similar sentence as the input. Sometimes the variation is quite less. That's why sometimes the scorers fail to determine the control properly and the agreement is not very high. Uh, for the auxiliary task, we do have uh, also, we, we also have good results. Uh, the sequence to sequence skyline that we use for the auxiliary task, it just trains on the text simplification data set itself. So it is bound to do uh, well, as per the, I, it is bound to have better blue scores and uh, relatedness uh, measures as well. For but, but then to to our surprise, the relatedness measure was not really that great. Uh, the readability was high. Uh, this was expected from the sequence to sequence system. But uh, it is also kind of very exciting to note that uh, the formalness mid and high uh, control values when given to our systems, they are actually also produce uh, sentences with high readability and they also match with the uh, original labels present in the data set. So for this task where there was some, some label data available, we also try to show the merit of our system. We also have done human evaluation. Uh, we considered human judgment of the, uh, for, for, the, for the outputs for 30 random instances uh, from the test data. Uh, the task was to rank, re based on readability, rank the sentences produced for different control outputs. Sentences were randomly given to the humans 
uh, they had to rank sentences based on whether some some sentences highly readable and uh, more readable than or uh, would require more understanding than uh, some other sentence. Based on that, we see that there is around 80% agreement between the human literate rank levels and ranking based on the control values computed by our scorers uh, for the output text. So it shows that really our system is capable of producing sentences based on the control inputs. These are some of the examples. The key takeaway from this is that one thing for sure is that the, the control, uh, when the control value becomes high, uh, the, the sentence tend to have more unusual words inserted, uh, injected into it, as opposed to when the control value is mid. Uh, however, one thing is, uh, it's very important to note that because we used a sampler that is heavily lexicalized, the sentences are mostly lexical variants of the input. The moment we start using some other more sophisticated sampling uh, systems, uh, for example, sampling based on VAE for getting syntactic variations, maybe the sentences will have more intriguing forms of uh, variations. Uh, system will produce more intriguing forms of variations. Right, so I'd like to conclude my presentation with this. So we proposed a novel unsupervised framework for controllable text transformation, which, has, uh, which is obviously uh, a key requirement in many industrial setting, settings. Our system relies on off-the-self NLP tools for uh, fluency, fluency, adequacy, and readability measurement. These are the key learning signals that come from external sources. But the core learning is, uh, it happens in an unsupervised manner where data is automatically generated and augmented and based on the data the system undergoes training uh, we tested the framework for text formalization but it's the way the the framework has been designed it is easily adaptable for other controllable controllable generation tasks for example one can tackle controllable simplification in a similar manner or sentiment transfer as long as you have metrics to decide how simple the sentence is or what kind of sentiment content the sentence has. Uh, in future, we'd, we would definitely like to pursue on those threads. And we would also explore better sampling strategies. Uh, for example, as I said, the system is now restricted to generate only uh, lexical variants. We can uh, have more complicated form of syntactic semantic variants produced by uh, better samplers that would we would like to try out in future. So that ends the presentation. Here, here are some links. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. It was a nice presentation. Uh, do we, if anybody has questions, you can unmute yourself. There's a little red microphone at the bottom of the screen as you hover over it. Um, so you can uh, uh, un unmute. And reminder to IBMers, this is an open talk, so please don't ask confidential questions. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, hi, this is Sanjana from IBM Almaden Research Center. Hi. So my question was, um, is there like facility to do domain-specific tuning or are you already doing any domain-specific tuning at the uh, or the sampling stage? Uh, not yet. This was intent. Like our intention was to produce a domain agnostic version. Uh, however, uh, see if the crux of the framework is this encoder decoder uh, module, which learns on unlabeled data. So as long as you have domain specific unlabeled data, which you can crawl from websites or mm -hmm. gather from documents, it's fine. The second requirement of our network is that. Uh, we should have uh, this, this scorers, right? So for example, we use readability grade uh, as a scoring uh, module. So for example, if you want some domain specific transfer, if you have such scorers available, let's say you build a classifier or you build a regressor or uh, you know any, any rule-based metric that suits the requirement of your domain, then I don't see uh, why it can't be using the system. Yeah, so pretty much depends on whether you have this external scorer available and some unlabeled data available as well. So whenever you do like uh, formalization, so let's say compliance or healthcare sentences, you're saying that the formalization will be like 
specific to the domain at the end because of the control predictor. Right. Okay. Um, and what about the human evaluators you use? Are they like specific subject matter experts or? No, these are uh, uh, like normal like ling linguists who have a better understanding of English uh, on the whole. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think we, we never had a very domain specific experimentation. So never thought of employing any subject uh, expert for this purpose. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hey, other questions? So I'll have one while people are gathering their thoughts. You, you talked early on when you were distinguishing the various kinds of text generation here of starting from non-textual sources, I'm assuming diagrams and database tables or uh, paper tables. Did, have you explored the non-text sources yet? Uh, yes, so that is, uh, I think, wa uh, what we have been focusing more uh, on, like major uh, portion of 2018 was spent on data to text, but we, we were focusing more on how do you summarize tables and knowledge graphs. Yes. So we do have some systems, modular systems available for uh, table to text uh, generation, translation and summarization. When I say translation, that means you have to translate every row, columns, every entity in the table uh, and produce a paragraph out of the table. Mm -hmm. uh, summarization on the other hand only focuses on some key interesting portion of the table. Uh, so for both we have tried uh, to build systems and we have published it. It'd be interesting to see uh, at some point if there's an overlap here with the accessibility community because they've had to do screen readers both for text and data pretty much, you know, there's, there's fascinating work, but an awful lot of it is just what works, not, you know, necessarily what's the mo most formal. And it seems that once you get into both text explanation and data summarization, there could be a real immediate benefit for uh, people who can't see the screens. Right. We had never thought about the accessibility part. Thanks for pointing. We are noting it down. Yeah. Our more major use case has been like the industry uh, document processing and content creation uh, sector. However, mm -hmm. uh, this is this is a very interesting uh, direction. Accessibility is something we never thought about. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions then? Please unmute yourself. Uh, hi. Uh, na uh, good talk. Um, it seems the system can substitute words, but uh, uh, but changing the grammar is a little tricky. For example, the grading, uh, the reading grade can simply be increased by choosing a more complex synonym. Uh, the semantic relatedness should also be similar, uh, but the fluency is the tricky part. Um, so uh, do you have anything more to add to the fluency uh, control uh, usage? Uh, right. So Thank as you. I said, sorry, uh, you had to add anything to that? Or? Uh, no, th that's fine. Yeah. Right. So uh, as I said, this, uh, so we have tried to make this uh, scoring part as open as possible. So you could typically add as many terms you want to this scoring uh, function G, X, Y. Uh, so if you want like the grammaticality to be tackled in a more uh, efficient manner, let's say you had, you have built a rule based grammar checker, like if these phrases are occurring, if there is a um, subject verb disagreement, if there is a noun number issue, or if there is any other kind of grammaticality issue, then I would penalize the generation more. So you could definitely have such modules in place. You could develop it using a heuristic based approach and then all what uh, all we have to do is add another term to this or maybe replace our current grammaticality or fluency checking function with that function and it would still work because uh, the the learning part is indirectly dependent on this so it need not be differentiable or it need not have the all those constraints that we typically have in our loss computation so as long as let's say you had you had access to something like the gra Microsoft Grammar Checker or some open grammar checker through which you can, you know, score the grammaticality, it would definitely deliver better. Yeah. But uh, as you said, like currently, I think uh, the grammar, grammar portion, the fluency part is only tackled by a language model, which typically gives more uh, uh, weightage uh, 
if if some phrases are looking good, then it is fine. So basically, if if you are using an n gram language model, then if four grams are fine, it's fine. Now it it never has a holistic view uh, of the sentence about the sentence. And uh, if you consider neural language models, still then uh, it loses uh, context because of the constraint. If the sentence grows longer, then it cannot really remember the initial portions, and uh, there are issues around that as well. So, but but then uh, if you look at G X Y again, it's an interplay. So if the readability is try getting if it is re the readability scores are dragging my sentence uh, generation to to generate more formal version and less grammatical versions, then the grammaticality or the fluency computation part will drag it back. So that's the reason we had this uh, composite scoring function. And we we do give weighted. So in our experiments, we do we did realize that if we give readability a higher weighted, sentences are super formal, as in they do have a lot of complicated words, but they are very very ungrammatical. So we had to uh, give more weighted to the grammar part, at least because it's okay to have a slightly more formal version, but the grammar should not be compromised. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, because like for example, in a text containing her highness. Uh, can be replaced by more formal her elevation, but the fluency of her yeah. highness is more than her elevation. Yeah, so I understand. Right. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Right. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I guess not. Okay. Uh, thank you again for a, for a very nice presentation. Um, thanks for everybody, even those I see on the West Coast who are up early. Um, the uh, seminar next week will also be an early one. Um, it's June 24th, Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, and it will be by Amrita Saha from IBM Research, Complex Program Induction for Querying Knowledge Bases in the Absence of Gold Programs. Um, as, as always, seminars will be posted a few days after they've been given in our YouTube channel. So, uh, Abhijit, again, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It was an honor for me to present. Thanks a lot.